of mercy, never ceasing, call us songs of blood us praise. Teach me something what is sounded, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain, fix upon it, mount of that redeeming love. Church, it's such a blessing to be able to connect with you, such a blessing to be able to open up God's word, such a blessing to be able to get our questions answered. And many, maybe there are questions we didn't even know we had. Today's message for this weekend is, got any questions for Jesus? And I hope you do. And I hope uh, this day, as we go through this passage in the book of Matthew, you will maybe get some questions you never thought about answered. Because here we're going to see a series of questions that, is, that are given to Jesus. Not, in a sense, good questions. They're questions that are given to trip him up. Questions to cause him to lose uh, the people and his followers 
questions to divide and questions that are going to cause problems. But we see that Jesus knows exactly what's going on and he answers the questions. And then at the end, we'll see that Jesus has a question for them. But also Jesus has a question for you and for me. And I hope we will answer that question correctly. So let's pray as we begin this day as we begin to look at God's word, let's pray for, for wisdom. Let's pray for discernment. Let's pray that he, we would understand what he's trying to teach us and the answers that he gives us. And let's do it now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lord, we come before you now and we thank you, Lord, that you answer our questions. Lord, you know our hearts. And Lord, more than that, you want to have a relationship with us. You have opened up the way so we can have a connection, that we can have a relationship, that we can have a new life, Lord, in you. And Lord, I pray that we'd understand and we'd see and we'd know what it means to be yours. And I ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen, church. Where let's uh, open up the word and let's get going. Uh, we are in Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, um, verses 15 through 46. And I hope you all made it through the storm and because of all the different things where I'm doing this one from home. But uh, I, I pray that everything went well with all of you as uh, you went through the storm. And, and we remember the one that holds the storms in his hands, the ones that hold our life in his hands is Jesus. And so let's put our lives in his hands. Let's rest in him uh, and let's seek him in the middle of the storm uh, because he's the one that brings peace, peace in our lives. So got any questions for Jesus? Matthew chapter 22, 15. Well, they did. <laughs> and we'll see why they had questions for Jesus. Uh, Matthew uh, twenty two fifteen. the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. Let's find a situation where we can cause Jesus to, in a sense, disqualify himself, say something we can use against him. Let's find a situation where we can trip him up, get him out of here, get him out of our lives, get all these people to stop following him so we can kill him. That's basically what they wanted to do. And we'll see that's what they achieved. At least they thought they were achieving their goal, their purposes, but they didn't know that Jesus was coming to die, coming to be that sacrifice for them, to give them life. But in this moment, all they wanted to do was to make him fall and to fall hard and to find as much things that what Jesus could say that they could use against him. And so they concocted a special situation where they could ask a question of Jesus that no matter what he said, <laughs> he would be in trouble. Are they going to catch him? Well, let's see. So they wanted to entangle him and they sent him their disciples. So we got this group of Pharisee disciples with the Herodians. And here's that uh, perfect storm coming together. Pharisees, uh, conservative, legalist, um, following the letter of the law, do not like Rome. They're not the zealots. They don't want revolt against Rome, but they, they want to do everything in their power to go against Rome because Rome is the oppressor. Rome is the one that is, that is um, changing all the ways that the Jewish men and Jewish people wanted to live and is causing them not to be able to fulfill the law and, and, and in many ways. Uh, causing problems. So even though they were under Rome and they followed the Roman rules, they were not happy about it. And uh, they wanted Rome gone. That's why they were waiting for the Messiah. They wanted the Messiah to come because in their mind, the Messiah was going to bring about an earthly kingdom that would get rid of Rome and put them in charge because they were the leaders of the law, the Pharisees, the ones that kept the law the conservative, the, the ones that just uh, were going to bring around a, a new nation under this new Messiah. And so that's the Pharisees. Then you have the Herodians. The Herodians had 
uh, in a sense, been absorbed by the Roman rule. They, they wanted to go along with the Romans. They wanted to, in a sense, profit from the Romans. And they adopted a lot of the practices of the Romans. They Romanized themselves, in a sense. And they were the perfect citizens, uh, pro-Rome. Yes, we love Rome. We want to do what uh, Rome is, is telling us. Rome is the best. And so they were Jewish, but they were Romanized, Hellenized, as a the Greek culture uh, that was prevalent there in the Roman rule, uh, philosophies and the arts and, and following all the customs of Rome that many times went in, in against the customs of the Jewish people. So you had these two groups that normally hated each other. They were against each other. They, they didn't want anything to do with each other, but they come together here and the Pharisees bring this about because they're going to ask Jesus a very specific question that one of these two groups is going to be mad at. One of these two groups is going to react. One of these two groups is going to come against each other and against Jesus because of the way that he answers. And you see, this is a very, in a sense, we look at politically charged moments. Now, we don't go through those nowadays, do we? <laughs> uh, any similarities to uh, current events um, is just by chance i guess so anyway we had these two groups coming together and they come to jesus and they give jesus a question and where's this group gives jesus a question and um but first of all <laughs> they come to jesus and bring him jesus come here we want to talk to you and we want you to be in the midst of this group of herodians and us and and the people are watching of course we got to get people they didn't have cameras and tv and reporters back then but they, let's get the people watching because word of mouth is pretty good still so they 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 went and they began saying jesus teacher we know that you are true when you teach the ways of god in truth nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of man basically they were doing what we call in mexico stroking his beard haciéndole la barba is is basically oh jesus you're so good or jesus Oh, we, we like the way you teach. Jesus, we know you don't really care about people's opinions. You don't care what people think about you. You just, you just tell the truth, right, Jesus? And you're going to tell the truth when we ask you this question, right? And they were acting all, oh, well, we love Jesus. Jesus, you're on our side. Uh, when they had a purpose and they had a plan. So tell us what you think, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we were just wondering, what do you think of this? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And here you go. Hellenized Jews, the, the Romanized Jews, well, they were all pro-Caesar. Pro of course, we're going to pay taxes to Caesar. We're loyal to the government. Okay, so if Jesus goes to their side, oh, he's leaving the people behind. Jesus is, is not caring for the people. And the people were oppressed by the Romans. They didn't like paying taxes. None of us really liked to pay taxes. And, they, and they, they looked at the Roman taxes as something that was heavy, that was just this burden that they could hardly uh, bear because many times not only Roman taxes, but then the tax collectors added their part. And that's why they even hated tax collectors even more. They were worse than dogs, worse than Samaritans. They were the worst of the lot. Tax collectors, oh, we don't need them. And so taxes was a big deal. So if Jesus said something pro-taxes or pro-Rome, he was going to be in trouble with the people because the people didn't like paying taxes. They didn't like tax collectors. And then if he said something pro the people or, or, or lift these taxes off the people, uh, you're being too harsh on the people, then the Hellenizers, the Romanized uh, um, Jews, would go back and tell Rome and say, Jesus is causing riots. Jesus is causing rebellion. He's telling them not to pay taxes. So the Pharisees thought, okay, we have the perfect question for him. He's going to lose either way. He's going to lose with the people or he's going to lose with Rome. Either one of them is going to cause his doom. And Jesus looks at them. I can just see him. It says verse 18, Jesus perceived their wickedness perceive their hearts, perceive the intention it, it behind all the questions, behind all that beard stroking and, and saying all those nice things about Jesus being a great teacher who told the truth. He knew their hearts. 
And he said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? You're saying all these nice things, but behind you have the dagger. You're just waiting to strike with that dagger, you hypocrites. And Jesus answers them. And he answers them in a way that they weren't expecting. He says, show me your tax money. And so they say, okay, here it is. And I don't have a, um, one of the coins they used back then. This is actually a half dollar. But the same idea, they had uh, uh, the emblem, the person on the hand and uh, on here. And, uh, and this is one of our presidents, the United States and uh, Kennedy. And um, they had him on it. Now, he, we usually put people on them after they die. They put people on them while they were living. So the kind of like England does, the queen is on all their bills. Uh, the same thing for uh, the Romans. Romans put their Caesar on their coins. And this was, uh, uh, it says here, uh, they brought him a denarius, tax money, uh, day's wages, basically. The tax they had to pay, day's wages, a denarius, depending on what they were charged. But they, they brought him this coin. This is what you were paid. This is actually a very valuable coin. Uh, and they brought it in, and he asked them a question. Whose image is on this coin? Who's there? And what inscription is it? Now, here we have, well, Kennedy. And it says, in God we trust. Now, <laughs> Back then, it wasn't in God we trust. It was Caesar's image and Caesar Augustus, the Caesar, the, the ruler. His name was written on the coin. And Jesus answers and tells, and they say to him, Caesar's. Jesus answers them and says, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were silent. It says, when they heard these words, they marveled. And they left him and went their way. They couldn't say anything. He, he had avoided, well, not avoided. What he'd done is he brought the question that they had out of the sphere uh, that they were trying to cause this conflict. And, and he brought, they brought in a spiritual sphere, a spiritual headship. You see this coin? Whose image? Caesar's. Give Caesar... What is Caesar's? But give God what is God's. They had forgotten the authority that they were under. Jesus reminded them that the sphere of authority, the sphere of authority belonged to God. Give to God what is God's. Individuals are subject also to his authority. Just like we're subject to Roman rulers in that time, or our rulers and our government in this time, he pointed out that they were also subject to God's authority. Give to God what is God's <clears throat> and give to Caesar what is Caesar. Man, you and I, have both political and spiritual responsibilities. And see, they were amazed at Jesus' answer. Both the Pharisees and the Herodians were silenced. And think about that for a minute. We're supposed to be, give to Caesar what is Caesar. We're supposed to be, in a sense, good citizens. We're supposed to honor that citizenship and do what we are, do what we're supposed to do as good citizens, pay our taxes, vote, um, be part of uh, what's going on in our nation, um, and actually be those citizens we're supposed to be. Thinking about that, it was interesting because I was, as I was preparing, I was remembering a time in church history when the church itself was greatly persecuted. And this was right kind of the end of the apostles, right when uh, John, before he died and he was exiled to the, to the Isle of Patmos, around 64 AD, uh, we see uh, the, one, the beginning of, of 10 cycles of persecution upon the church. Some of them were local, some of them were empire-wide, but we see this persecution beginning and going on for almost 300 years. And, and we see this persecution against the church um, and the church responding. How does the church respond? Let's fight back against the persecutors. No. The church responds, uh, in a sense, writing letters in their defense. This is the, kind of the beginning of apologetics. 
What is apologetics? It's a defense of the faith. It's trying to, to bear light so people would understand what it was and what it meant to be a Christian. And in the beginning of apologetics, you have the, the apologists and several of the early church fathers, one of whom is Justin Martyr. And Justin Martyr was an early church apologist. He wrote an apology, not saying forgive me, but an apology, basically a defense of the faith. And he wrote it directly to the emperor, directly to Caesar. And he wrote these letters talking about who Christians were, trying to show them uh, the way they lived, the way they worshiped, show them that they were actually good citizens. They weren't going against the government. And in his first apology, he writes this. He says, Christians make the best citizens. Uh, he reasoned with the empire and said, they are the best helpers. They are allies in securing good order. And the reason is that they are convinced um, that no wicked man can be hidden from God and that everyone goes to eternal punishment or salvation according with the character of his actions. God is judging. God calls us to be good citizens. God calls us to, to act in a way that we reflect him in all we do. You see, we have a citizenship on earth, the nation that we live, but we also have a citizenship in heaven. And we are to live according to our citizenship in, citizenship in heaven. But we also need to realize that we are, in a sense, merely passing through the earth that we live in. We, we are on our way to an eternal kingdom with God. We're on our way to serve him and to live for him with all of our life. That's why when Jesus talked about this, he, he showed the Pharisees and he pointed out to the Pharisees, there are two spheres of influence. There are two spheres in a sense of authority on your lives. You have a earthly, kingdom authority over you, but you also have a spiritual godly authority over you. And this spiritual godly authority, our citizenship is in heaven, needs to qualify, needs to, to give life to, and needs to uh, motivate how we live in our earthly spiritual, our earthly uh, governmental, in a sense, sphere. The problem is they wanted to bring both things together. They wanted to, to, to bring this. How can we pay taxes and, we, and honor God? No, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God. And what's happened nowadays, I think with a lot of us, we've kind of mixed them all together also in our own lives. We've mixed them together and we become very political. And right now, as I, oh, pastor is going to start talking politics. Oh, okay. Oh, and then we all kind of get a little nervous here and we're going to touch some hot buttons. Is he going to, I know we're in a political season. Yeah, we're voting in a, in a few weeks, or maybe some of you already voted and mailed in your ballots, or I don't know. But we're in a very politically charged season. And what has happened in this atmosphere in which we live? Very much like the situation we see here with Jesus. Um, people are asking you and me questions. Who are you going to vote for? Well, maybe they're not so blunt. So what party are you from? What do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And what do you think about this topic? And you see many times we, uh, in a sense, are, are feel kind of maybe boxed in or feel that we have to go to a certain party or we have to go to a certain uh, political view or, or we have to either be one or the other if we're gonna be Christians. And you know what? We're not giving Caesar what is Caesar or God what is God. We're kind of giving it all together and blending it all together. And we become very little like Jesus in our politics, we can become very little like uh, what Jesus is calling us to be, and we become just like the world, just like the world. I was reading this book, and I've recommended it several times. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it one more time. It's called Christians in the Age of Outrage by Ed Stetzer. And I love this image here. We have a little lamb. You know, the church is supposed to be the lambs of God, the sheep that follow the master. But look at the teeth on this one. 
And it's kind of a picture here of these wolf teeth <laughs> just snarling just like the rest of the pack. And you see, this is not what we're supposed to be. And it says how to bring out our best when the world is at its worst. And um, I just want to read you one thing real quick here. It says, as we talk about all these issues and hot buttons and hot topics, it says we need to be constructive. We need to offer Christians a vision of how to navigate the outrage and be more effective in showing and sharing the love of Christ. You see, we've divided ourselves. We're, we're all wondering, you know, politically, oh, if we're not here, if we're not there, if we're not exactly on pro all this or pro all that or this group or this group, or if we look or talk about certain issues, oh, you must be with them. Oh, we talk, oh, you must be with them. Oh, you must be this. You see, church, we're called to give to Caesar what is Caesar. What does that mean? To be good citizens, to vote, to, to care about our country, to give good examples. But this citizenship we have on earth needs to be qualified, needs to be uh, imbued and filled by our greater citizenship in heaven because we serve a risen savior. We are citizens of heaven, citizens of a an, an, uh, heavenly kingdom. And we, we need to reflect his values, his love. You see, it's not a political agenda that God is endorsing. God is endorsing us to show his love, his joy, his peace, his gentleness, his faithfulness, his self-control, self-control, typing we got the quickest WhatsApp, quickest Facebook fingers in the West. Somebody says something, oh, we're typing something back. Self-control, bite your tongue. What would God say in this one? What would Jesus say in this one? In this situation we just looked at, it could have been a hot topic. And, G and then we could have, Jesus could have said, oh, well, you and the Romans, I, I have a plan for the Romans. They're, you know, they're going to be destroyed and, and they're going to come. And you guys, you know, the Romans are going to kind of also come in and destroy here. And, and he could have <laughs> said, because both of you, you know, both of you are not following me. But no, he pointed to the truth. He pointed to love. In this situation you're trying to talk about, this coin, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Be a, a good citizen. Do your duty. Honor God. But don't forget, give to God what is God's. You have a higher authority. You have, in a sense, an eternal citizenship. You need to reflect that citizenship and not look like the rest of the world. We need to honor God in all that we do, all that we say, how we react to one another. And even, <laughs> because right now Christians, oh, you must be here, or you must be there, or you must not care about this, or you, uh, and all the things. We're getting hit hard. We're getting hit hard. And what did Jesus say? Slap you on one cheek? You punch him back harder so they don't hit you. No. <laughs> Give them the other. They hated you. Don't forget, they hated me first. They persecuted you. Don't forget, they persecuted me for, first. And what did Jesus do when they hated him? They persecuted, they spit on him. He loved them. He loved them so much that he stretched out his arms and hung on the cross to pay for their sins. That's the love that Jesus wants you and I to give to this world today. Not join on the bandwagon of divisions and church divisions and, and, and I'm better than you are. And you see, that's the many times the, the, the predominant thing in the church today. We're not showing the love of Jesus. We're mixing culture and, and, and our uh, Caesar stuff with God stuff and the church stuff. And, and we're being just like the world. I was also reading this morning in this book by Jesse Penn Lewis about divisions and, and our, our, our not being spiritual about following the Lord. And, and it's, he says this, he says, the way in which the ungoverned life of the soul causes division, the un, 
governed. And notice that we're not under authority. We're not subject to God's kingdom. We're kind of living as we, as we see fit in our emotions, in our will, in our intellect. This ungoverned life to the soul causes division is brought out in the revised version of the Bible, which translates, they separate themselves in Jude 19, or they make separations. And this is what Jude is talking about. The people inside the church, they're making separations. Or those are these are those who make separations, who separate, who cause divisions. It says Fawcett wrote in his commentary, arrogant, setting up of themselves as having a greater sanctity and a wisdom and a peculiar doctrine distinct from others and is, is implied. Like the Pharisees, oh, we're so much better than everybody else. They're wrong and they're wrong and they're wrong and, and, and we are right. We're the only ones who are right. And that's why they couldn't accept Jesus because he wasn't from their inner circle. He wasn't the Messiah that they had in mind. It was a very different Messiah than they had planned. To separating oneself and considering oneself to have a greater sanctity than others are always indications of the soulish life, the life following our intellect. Jesus taught that the world was to separate, would separate believers. The world would reject believers. But believers should not separate themselves from one another. We should be one. As Jesus says in his prayer in John 17, that they may be one as you, Father, in heaven and I are one. You and me, me and them. And together in that oneness, we are to follow and obey the will of God. Oneness. Unfortunately, it's not a picture of what we see in the church today. Divisions. This, this intellectual Christianity, this, this looking for our ideas, this causing divisions amongst ourselves instead of bringing a oneness because we've subjected ourselves to a heavenly kingdom. We are given to God what is God's. We are giving our life to him. And in this relationship with him, this vertical relationship with him, our, our, our life is changing so that when we react to others, we are showing his love to others. When we give to Caesar what is Caesar, we give it with the love of God that it fills us and imbues us. One of the issues and one of the things we're gonna see this here, not only with this question, but with the other ones, is that these Pharisees had an idea that God was very much like them. <laughs> They would have loved to have been the God in their own world because they thought God should be exactly like they were. And in Psalm 50, the psalmist addresses this. And it's a, it's, a, it's a verse that has caused me to think a lot, especially looking at this topic today. And I think it should cause us all to think. Psalm 50, verse 16 starts this way. But to the wicked, God says, and remember the Pharisees, he, Jesus says he perceived their wickedness. And this is what God says to them and what God says to us when we try to use God for our own means and our own ends. It says, what right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenants in your mouth? What rights have you to use me for your own ends, for your own politics, your own ideas? Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. You don't follow what, what, I, what you're saying that we were supposed to do. You don't follow my words. You just use them for your own ends. It says, when you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. Watch out because you thought I was just like you. And that's what verse 21 says. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you. And isn't that the case many times? We want a Jesus in our own image. We want a God just our size that we can control and manipulate and use for our own ends instead of subjecting our lives to his authority and giving God what is God's, our life, our love, our relationship, our being filled with him so that he and our relationship with him transforms 
what we give to Caesar, what we give to this world. We thought that we were all together like God. And we were very, very, very wrong. You see, that's the problem with the Pharisees. And now we'll see that's the same problem with the Sadducees. They thought everything was going to continue the same way it had before. Everything was just the way that they thought it would be. We need to get that out of our minds. We need to realize that we're subject to a higher authority. We're subject and we need to give God what is God's. And if we do that, we'll be able to give Caesar or our earthly authority what is due to them because we're filled with God and we feel we're filled with his power and his purpose. So let's go to the next question. I just get one and I'm going uh, quite long with that one, but I think this sets the, the stage for the next questions that are coming. So the Pharisees left, couldn't do it. And then we had the Sadducees and they're sad, you see. No, that's an old joke. But the Sadducees were sad because they had all these ideas, these strange ideas in their mind. They said, we'll see here the same day, the Sadducees, verse 23, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him. And, and this was a group of people who basically, they had these strange ideas and they had these teachers who had told them and they were following these teachers that say, when, when you die, that's it no resurrection you're nothing to go this is you live your life you, you're done and you die and no more it's all done there's no future you know no no heaven um no hell it's just this is the life you live and we had this group of, of jewish sadducees this this uh leadership group because they had power and authority uh, but they had these strange ideas that went against the Pharisees, and usually Jesus could could kind of play them off each other. He did that several times between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But this was, in a sense, a very political group, with a group that had power uh, and had really strange ideas, kind of maybe like today, like a lot of the these conspiracy uh, groups and theories and ideas that are going around, some strange things that are going on around us. We say, oh, well, you know, those are Christians. Yeah, well, they have these strange ideas, and I'm not sure what's going on there. And say some interesting ideas and doctrines. Well, not maybe interesting, but some some things that that are quite out there. And that's with this group here, the Sadducees. They were quite out there, looking at you know what is going on with this group. So they come to Jesus and say, "Well, we're now the Pharisees couldn't trip him up. We will." will cause problems for Jesus. So we're going to give him a word problem. And we know uh, we all hate math word problems. And this is not exactly a word problem, but it almost sounds like it. It's one of those things is like, who writes these things? Who thinks these things up? Well, let's see what these Sadducees things up, thought up back then. I said, okay, teacher, Moses said, and they started quoting the Bible, that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. And that was a mosaic life, but law, basically. And so the family name would get passed on. If this husband and wife married, the husband died, they had no children. So they could pass on the family name. The wife would marry the brother. And when they had their first child, that first child would receive the name of the dead husband and the family line would continue. It was a way to, to, to safeguard the continuation of the family name and the family line. And Moses set that up for the people of Israel. So here goes the word problem. So there were seven brothers. It doesn't start just like all these word problems. And uh, they just, and the first died after he had married and having no offspring, he left his wife to his brother. Okay, that's, that's good so far. And likewise, the second and the third, even to the seventh. And like, wow, after the second and third, the fourth and fifth brothers probably should have moved because as soon as this, they marry this wife, they're going to die without kids. And, and so they probably should have moved somewhere else. But it's a word problem. And uh, sometimes it doesn't make quite sense, but they're trying to prove a point and they're trying to trip Jesus up, just like many of these word problems have tripped us up in the past. So even to the seventh, and then the woman dies. Okay, they all die in the end. And then they go to heaven. 
And the resurrection is like, wait a minute, didn't they not believe in the resurrection? That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to give this absurd example to actually make, you know, the resurrection it doesn't make sense. And then trip up Jesus. So they say, whose wife of the seven will she be? For she, for they all had her. They were all his wife or her wife. His, yeah, she was married to all of them. So whose wife is she in heaven? And Jesus, once again, is like, you don't know, you don't understand this very much. Well, this is what he says. Jesus answered them and said, you're mistaken. Okay, you're wrong. And that's a great way to answer a word problem. You're wrong. Okay, whoever wrote this was wrong, which is wrong. Um, but this is what he answers. Not knowing the scriptures, number one, not knowing the word and not knowing the power of God. You don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. And that's why you're wrong. So what does he mean? What do they not know? Well, first of all, he says, for in the resurrection, he says the resurrection, it happens. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So in the resurrection, in heaven, there, there is not going to be any marriage. This is not something we need to even worry about. So this word problem is actually a mess, and we don't even worry about it, because in heaven, things are not like things here on earth. Just like we think we, that, that God is just like us. We thought that God was just like us. We think also that heaven is going to be just like this, you know, like the world around us, married and given in marriage and living. And okay, so we won't die, but we're just going to live just like this. And we're just going to continue on like this. And they had this idea, well, it's just going to be just like this. Well, actually, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They want to live life now. And who cares what happened later? Because they thought that was it. And he said, you know, heaven is very different than here. Heaven is something so much better, so much grander, so much more wonderful, so much more amazing than the things on earth have no comparison. This marriage, and many people are going, oh, maybe the young people who are not married, it's like, oh, well, I don't want to go to heaven. I won't be able to get married. <laughs> or maybe it's people who are married and going, oh, I want to go to heaven because I am married. But uh, hopefully not. If you do, we have counseling available. We can start working on that issue. Maybe others of you are happily married and go, wow, well, I want to stay here a little bit longer because if I'm not going to be married in heaven, what am I going to do? Jesus said, you don't understand. In heaven, it's going to be so much better. The marriage is actually a picture of the relationship between Jesus and the church. Jesus represents the husband who gives his life for the church for his wife. And the wife represents the church who submits and who loves. And, and, and this bond represents the, the, the unity, in a sense, the, the responsibility given to God, what is God, that relationship we have with him. This is so much deeper than just a marriage relationship. In heaven, things are going to be so much better, so much more amazing, so much more than we can ask, think, or imagine. We can't understand we have a few glimpses of what heaven's like, but we don't really know and understand. But when we get there, marriage, it won't be a big deal because we will be in a sense of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will be in the presence of the crucified Savior and we will be worshiping him and lifting our, our, our hands to him because he has given us life and we will spend an eternity with him. Many of you, oh, I think heaven's gonna be boring. <laughs> We don't even understand. It's going to be the most amazing thing that we can never imagine. <laughs> and so Jesus says, you don't understand heaven. You don't understand the word. Um, and here it goes with the word part. Concerning the resurrection that he brings up of the dead, have you not read? Don't you know? And see, that's the problem with many of these conspiracy theories and things that are going on. They, they have all the verses, and they find the verses that best, best suit their ideas. And notice there's a difference. They look at their ideas and what verses can we use to show Christians that these ideas that we're bringing out that are all out there are, are biblical. So they bring their verses and they bring things out of context. So they bring things that are going to suit their needs. And we see like in Second Peter, it talks about how people twist 
the scriptures for their own ends. And they use the words just like they use it. Oh, Moses, Moses said this. So how can this be? And Jesus says, you don't know the word. You don't know the word or the power of God. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to God saying? What God spoke, these are the words of God. And God said, I am, just that, I am. And that is in a sense his name. I am the self-existing one. I am the one who created the universe. But it also says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And very simply put, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. How can God be the God of Abraham? How can God be the God of Isaac? How can God be the God of Jacob if they're dead, if everything's over? God would have said, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of, of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob, but now I am your God until you die. Then I was your God too. No, <laughs> you see, God is. God is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, and everyone who has died and is in his presence, died this physical death, but an eternal life with God or separated from him. And it all depends. Once again, we go back to that authority. Are we giving God what is God's? Are we under his authority? Have we submitted to him? Have we realized that we serve a risen savior? We serve a God who's paid the price for you and me to come into his presence, to have that relationship with him. And we'll see a little bit more of that in the third question. But you see, they did not understand. They didn't understand that God was a God of the living. And once again, they are without words. The multitudes heard this, they were astonished and the Sadducees were so sad, you see, that they left because Jesus had, <laughs> had nixed their word problem. <laughs> they had to think of a better one next time. But something that comes to mind as we look at this one, uh, and, and it's in the book of John, and it's Jesus speaking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, the outcast. Remember the Samaritans were those that everybody despised. Nobody wanted to, to uh, be around them, especially the Jews, because uh, they were like these half-breeds. They were the ones that had taken a little bit of, of Jewish blood and mixed it with these, this blood of these people that the Assyrians brought to their land after they took the, the Israelites away. Not only that, they'd also mixed the religions. They brought their own religions and mixed it with the, the gods of the land. So they brought these, these priests that were li still living in that area to teach them about the gods of the land. So they, they followed a kind of a mixed religion, a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of all these other things. And the Jews despised them. They were worse than dogs, worse than tax collectors, you know. We don't like tax collectors, but the Samaritans, they're worse. They hate him so much that when they went from Galilee in the north part of Israel to Judea, and they went down to Jerusalem in the southern part, and Samaria is right in the middle, they would actually go out and down and over because they didn't want to go through Samaria, which was the quickest way. And they just didn't want to step on Samaritan land. Once again, we see the divisions. Once again, we see people who are living that intellectual, spiritual, well, not spiritual, soulish life, the intellectual life uh, of their idea of Christianity, not submitting to God, not submitting to the authority of God, but with their own ideas and their own uh, ends and means and what they want to do and um, causing divisions, causing divisions, causing, once again, this this uh, lamb with teeth, that was the Pharisees. They were those lamb with big teeth uh, that would come and, and backbite anyone who was not on their side. But we see here Jesus speaking to this woman as she begins to speak, as he begins to speak and share with her, uh, she begins to perceive that this, this, this man, he's something special. And she asks him a question, verse 19 says, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. So answer me this question. Once again, this woman has a question for Jesus. Uh, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. This is where our fathers, this is where our church meets. This is what we do. And you Jews say in Jerusalem, and you have these things that you do at your church. So is it our church and how we do things or your church and how you do things? Remember once again, divisions and everything. 
where we ought to worship? And Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, uh, the hour is coming when you, well, actually I skipped something, uh, says, um, no, I stood in. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when we will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship, uh, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers, this is what Jesus is looking for, true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth, God's word, God's power coming together. And remember what did Jesus say? You don't know the scriptures, you don't know the word, and you don't know the power. That's what the Sadducees were sad because they didn't know the scriptures. They used scriptures, twisted them for all their own means, and they didn't know the power of God. They didn't know the message behind the word of God. Same with the Pharisees. The Pharisees used, there were all these picky and they were, they were doing all these, you know, tithing and they were causing the little plants and, and they were tithing the mint and the cumin and this, but they had forgotten the heart of the gospel, the power of the word. They'd forgotten the, the message that God was giving through his word to bring life and renewal and blessing. And they were also, they knew a lot of the scriptures, but they didn't know God's power. They didn't know God's power. They didn't worship him in spirit and in truth. And this woman says, you know, I know the Messiah is coming. I know he's coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, and remember that, the Messiah who is called the Christ, we'll look at that in a minute. When he comes, he will tell us all things. He's the one that's going to have all the answers, the Messiah. And Jesus tells her, I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. I have the answers. Get to know me. Give to God what is God's. Understand that authority that comes down from heaven, that, that worship me in spirit and in truth. Know the word, and your whole life will be different. You will have the answers that you seek. Worship God in spirit and in truth. Last one. The, the, the Pharisees heard that he'd silenced the Sadducees. They were happy about that. So they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, uh, this is a scribe, one of the lawyers. Oh, the ones that studied all day long, seven days a week, uh, studied the law, every little aspect of it. You know what? The best way, the Sadducees use a word problem. You guys use one of those hot topics, you know, trying to cause division. I'm going to see if he knows the law. I'm going to give him uh, to try to find what is the greatest law. So he comes to him and asks him a question. Once again, testing him, testing him. Do you know as much as I do? Do you have as much knowledge as I do? I'm a, I'm a, a, a lawyer. I've been studying the law. I'm, one of the, I'm a scribe who's been copying and knowing the law. Do you know as much as I do? Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the, them all? Commandments, there were 300 or 400. There were all these commandments that they were supposed to follow. I think it's 300 and something commandments they were supposed to follow. And then there were also the, the interpretations of those commandments they were supposed to follow. And the Jews to this day, they have all the commandments. And then they have the interpretations of different uh, rabbis, different teachers of those commandments. And they study the not only the commandment, but they also study the interpretations of these commandments. And who said this interpretation and that interpretation and which one is right and which one is wrong. And it's a whole convoluted mess as they try to figure what is the truth. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm gonna give you the cliff notes. <laughs> I'm gonna summarize it all in two. I'm gonna summarize all the law of the prophets in two of these commandments. And Jesus said to him, number one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. This one's found in Deuteronomy. And it's, it's one of the, the, the main ones we see in Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all, I mean, your, all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Everything, every part of you, loving God. That is, in a sense, our vertical relationships, we, we, which we talk about on and on and on. 
and I hope you get it because I keep repeating it, uh, our vertical relationship is the most important one, the greatest commandment, loving God with all our hearts, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and letting him fill us with his love and his power and his mercy and, and his knowledge and teaching and his word, loving God. And then he says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And the second commandment was a smaller commandment given in the book of Leviticus, but he brings them together and he says, these two together, everything, all the law and the prophets hang on these two. This is where they flow from. This is where they come from. And why is that? James Bryan Smith says this about this passage. He says, when Jesus was asked to sum up the whole of the law, he answered by coupling the great Deuteronomy edict about loving God and a seemingly lesser law of Leviticus about loving your neighbor. Why did Jesus combine them? Because he knew they were essentially one law. Love comes from one source, that vertical relationship we talk about, uh, God. God. We love, said John, because God first loved us. The reason we love is because God loved us first. That's the reason we can love others. In the face of God's magnificent love for us, we cannot but love in return. As we see God's love in us, we can't but love in return to love others. When that love is known and felt by us, it affects how we view ourselves and ultimately how we view one another. You see, when we see God's love and we see his word, it remember that's that mirror that shows us how we are. And we see that the teachings of God, the things he teaches us through that love, it brings reproof. It brings correction. It brings instruction and righteousness. We begin to work in our heart and the way we act and the way we react to others affects our life. We says we, how we see ourselves. And then it says, God's love for us results in a proper love for ourselves that extends to the love for our neighbors. We put ourselves in the correct perspective as we see who God is. And then we become that conduit for God's love to reach out to others. We become that conduit for his love and his mercy and his joy and his peace to be reflected to this world out there. Remember what I said? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. How do we give Caesar what is Caesar's? Well, first, we give God what is God's. We give him that relationship. We submit to him. We, we seek him in that vertical relationship, his love flowing into us. And as it changes us and transforms us, we are able to give Caesar what is Caesar's. We are able to give the world the, what it needs. We are able to be those good citizens and love others the way God loves them because we're, in, we're imbued in God's love. We're filled with his love and we're giving it to others. You see, our heavenly citizenship affects our earthly citizen or should affect our earthly citizenship. It's that vertical and horizontal relationship. One last question, but now it's not people asking Jesus a question. It's Jesus asking them a question. And it's this group of Pharisees that are there that he asks. And so while the Pharisees were gathered, verse 41, Jesus asked them and, and saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The Christ, remember Christ, the Messiah. When we know that the Messiah will come, that is the Christ, the Messiah, he will teach us all things. And so these Pharisees rapidly respond. They knew this. They'd studied this all their life. When the, when the, when the Messiah comes, whose son is he? Oh, the son of David. Of course, it was just that one of those rapid responses. They, they knew this. Oh, okay, we're, we're doing good with this quiz. Oh, son of David. Okay. So the problem was, is that they believed that the Messiah was going to be, in a sense, one of them, one of the best Pharisees, the one who studied the most, the one who, who applied himself and who lived the most righteous life would be the Messiah. Because somehow through the line of David, this super Pharisee would come around and this super Pharisee would be the Messiah, the one that in, in a sense, a human being that was going to bring the kingdom of God on this land, throw the Romans out, you know, bring the spiritual kingdom and do great things. You see, they had it all wrong. They didn't realize that a spiritual man 
like that didn't exist because we're all sinners. We're all in need of saving. And the only one who could bring that salvation, the only one who could, who could get to the root problem, who the only one who could touch the heart of man and transform and pay the price that needed to be paid was God. So God sent his son, his son Jesus, who was divine and who was also a human being. He became one of us. God came down from heaven to earth. He lived a perfect life. He humbled himself even to the death of a cross for you and for me. That suffering savior, the servant of all. And that's what they couldn't believe. No, no, no. God can't do that. God is one. How can he have a son? How can he send him down? How can in Jesus, you know, when they call themselves God, no, he's blasphemy. Let's stone him. So Jesus answers him, okay, you say he's the son of David? So answer me this question, he says. How does David in the spirit call him Lord? And when does he do that? Well, he begins, Jesus, quoting Psalm 110 where David is writing this psalm, and in a sense is a messianic psalm, a psalm that looks forward to the Messiah, and in the Spirit, because God is the one that inspired him to write this. So in the Spirit, David calls him Lord, and this is what it says. The Lord, and notice, in, in at least in the New King James Version, Lord, big uh, letters, L-O-R-D, said to my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord said to my Lord, the Lord. You see, that word for Lord is Adonai. Adonai, which means God. How can he be a man and also be divine, be God? If David calls him Lord, Jesus says, how is he his son? <laughs> these learned men, these ones that have studied hours and hours and hours, had no answer. They, no one was able to answer him with a word, verse 46 says. Not from that, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. <laughs> okay, we're done asking Jesus questions because we're going to fail. They were done with questions. They're going to look at some other ways to destroy Jesus. But see, that's a very good question. You see, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Adonai, God. He, and God sent his son to give his life for you and for me, the Messiah, the one with all the answers. So what do we think about the Christ? What do you and I think about the Messiah, the one who has all the answers? Who is he? Who is he for you? Who is he for me? Oh, he's a good man. He's, you know, he, he taught all these things. He wrote them down. You know, it's too bad he got killed on a cross and people kind of remembering my crosses and everything else. But he has some good teachings that we need to follow and kind of emulate and, and know, you know, he had good words we have to know. You're not giving God what is God's. What is God's? Our life. You see, when Jesus came and died on the cross for you and for me, the Bible says we were bought with a price. We are no longer our own. We don't belong to ourselves. Jesus paid the price for you and for me on the cross. So what does it mean to give to God what is God's? Our life, your life, my life. It belongs to him. And the beauty of it, when it belongs to him, when we love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and when all our mind, when we obey him and give our life to him, and we realize that God is not like one of us, <laughs> which we were very confused about that. He's something altogether more wonderful, more mighty, more powerful. This, this heaven and this, this spiritual life is not what we think, oh, it's just like better earth. No, it's so much more. You see, we need to change the way we think. 
We need to look at this vertical relationship that Jesus through the cross opened up and how we can relate and we can seek God and he can fill us with his love and his power and he can teach us through his word. And, and we go know and adore and, and praise God and worship him in spirit and in truth, like true worshipers. You see, those are the ones God is looking for. And you and I can know the Messiah. I am he who is speaking to you today. The Pharisees? No, not going to acknowledge him. I'm not going to give God what is God's. I like my earthly kingdom that I've started here. Uh, I, I, wanna, I know these Romans are here, but I'm going to keep my kingdom. I'm not going to give God what is God's. I give my God. I have my, my image of God. He looks just like me. You know, I could be one of those great super messiahs if God would just make me the messiah. No. They're not willing to bend the knee. They're not willing to recognize that Jesus came from heaven to earth. He lived this perfect life. He became the servant and humbled himself to death, to the death of a cross, the worst death there could be. And the Bible says in Philippians, because of that, God lifted him up. He rose again from the grave. He lifted him up to heaven, and he's preparing a place for you and me. And the scripture says, one day, one day, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even the Pharisees, even the Herodians, even the Sadducees, Yes, they're going to be in that uh, resurrection uh, for good or for bad. Everyone, you and me, are going to be before the risen Savior, the one who paid the price for you and for me to save us from our sins, who's inviting us to this relationship to worship him in spirit and in truth. He's invited us to come into his presence, to seek him, and to give him the authority that is due. What's your answer going to be? Well, that day, for good or for bad, you're going to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Some of us are going to say it with joy, with gladness, because we've bent the knee. We've submitted to God. We've given God what is God. We realize that this earth is not our home. We're passing through. And while we're here, we're going to be the best citizens and, and, and reflect God no matter if we get slapped or hit or spit on. We're going to give the love back because this is not our home. We're preparing for a heavenly kingdom. We're preparing to be in his presence. And he is the one we serve. And our citizenship, our, our giving God what is God, will imbue and focus and fill the love that we give to others as we give to Caesar what is Caesar's. but we'll be in his presence for eternity. Others, others who have built their own kingdoms, nice little beautiful kingdoms on earth in their own image, Christianized kingdoms even, following names and people and and programs and conspiracy theories and ideas and all their own making also one day we'll recognize we'll see and we'll say jesus christ is lord but they will say it with a heaviness of heart they will say it with great sadness brokenness because at last they have seen, at last they understand what they refuse to acknowledge, what they refuse to see, what they refuse to follow. And eternity, the resurrection. You, you see, sometimes there's groups and ideas in the church today that have tried to say, oh, you know what? For those who don't follow Jesus, those who don't spend an eternity with him, well, oh, we don't want to be mean to them you know what? They're just going to cease to exist. They'll acknowledge Jesus. They'll say, yes, Jesus, your Lord. But then God is just going to go poof, and they'll be gone. 
We're going to put them out of their suffering. And we don't see what it says. Once again, don't you know the word? Don't you know the power of God? You see rejection. Rejection means also an eternity. Also an eternity, recognizing that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it's an eternity separated from God, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, church. Those of you who listen to me today, those of you who hear this today, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be separated from him. You don't want to be in that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. You're going to recognize Jesus one day. You're going to bend the knee one day. Wouldn't it be so much better to do it now? Wouldn't it be so much better to recognize him now, to give God what is God's today? You will be so much more happy and glorious and joyful when you get to meet your Savior, if you do. You see eternity, it's here, it's coming. All of us are eternal beings. We will live for eternity with God or without, separated. The choice is now. You see the choices we make today, giving God what is God's, giving Caesar what is Caesar's, recognizing and knowing the word and the power of that word, worshiping him in spirit and in truth, loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, recognizing that he is the Messiah, the bringer of truth, the one who's going to answer our questions, will change our future. You know, church, the more I see, the more I look around us, he's coming soon. Will you be ready? Will you be ready to meet the risen Savior in joy? Will you be ready to answer the question, who do you say that I am? May he be your Messiah. May he be your Christ, your Lord, your Adonai, your God and King. And may you serve him with all your heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your power. Thank you for the life you give us, Lord. And Lord, now we just want to put ourselves before you, Lord, and recognize that you paid the price to save us from our sins. You paid the price to give us life. And Lord, help us to give you what is due. Help us to give you our lives. And let that life that we live in you, as we had that vertical relationship with you, Lord, fill us and change us and transform us so that we might give others during our time on earth your love, reflecting you, reflecting your love and mercy and peace, and most of all, reflecting your, your invitation so that they also can know you, Lord, and have the life that we do. Lord, help us to be your hands and your feet, your voice, to share your heart and love with others in this needy world. Help us to be those best citizens, even when we're persecuted, because we know that our actions reflect who we belong to. Our actions on this earth reflect who's in charge. Lord, help us to represent you. Help us to live for you, Lord, with our all in all. And Lord, may we be ready to meet you face to face. Whether you take us now or we meet you in the air, Lord, may we be ready to live for you now and Lord, be in your presence, glorifying your name when we get to see you face to face. Because you are our Lord, 
You are a Messiah. You are a King. And we love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Amen, Lord. Amen. Church, as always, it's a blessing. And I just pray. I just pray that Lord would continue to fill you. And Lord, that you would you would show them this vertical relationship. And every day you'd get to know your Savior more and more and more as you put your eyes on him. Seek him first. And all these other problems you're worried about, all these other situations, all these other things going on, all these political things going on will be put in the proper perspective. Seek him first. Give God what is God's so that we can give Caesar what is Caesar's and give this world the love that is going to transform lives. Amen. Wednesday, midweek Bible study, we're going to enter the judges and look at the judges, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, it's also a movie, but this is the good, the bad, and the ugly in judges, and we'll get to see them and get to meet them in these next uh, couple of weeks. Um, don't miss it. And also don't forget on Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning, we have our fellowship time. Don't miss that either. It's one thing to get the word and to listen and to be filled with the word, but also we need to fellowship one with another. We need to pray with each other. That's what it means to be a church. Don't skip it. Join us on Zoom for the Agape God's Love Fellowship. And let's fellowship one with another. Church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he dwell richly in you, and may he give you peace. Amen and amen.